because the Latin called her Virgo. Mary was a Virgo. <laughs> Didn't mean the same thing at all. Virgo actually in Latin meant nothing more than a young woman. A young woman. To have meant the same thing as virgin does to us today, the Latin would have been Virgo intacta, that is to say, a young woman intact. So let's look back beyond the Latin text. Let's see why they called her Virgo, a young woman. Maybe they actually got something right, which we've got wrong later on. We discover that the word translated to mean Virgo, a young woman, was the old Hebrew word Alma, which meant a young woman. Had no sexual connotation whatever. Had Mary actually been physically Virgo intacta, the Hebrew word used would have been Bethlehem, not Alma. So we discover that we've been completely misguided by the original Gospels. Not so, we've been dis misguided by the English language translations of the Gospels. We've also been misguided by a church establishment that has done everything in its power to deny women any normal lifestyle in the Gospel story. The New Testament's key women are virgins, or whores, or sometimes widows. Never ever, everyday girlfriends, wives, mothers, certainly not ever priestesses or holy sisters, Notwithstanding that, the Gospels tell us time and time and time again that Jesus was descended from King David through his father Joseph. Even St. Paul tells us this point in his epistle to the Hebrews. But we're taught that his father was a lowly carpenter and his mother was a virgin, neither of which descriptions can be found in any original text. So it follows that to get the best out of the Gospels, we've really got to read them as they were written, not as we decide to interpret them according to modern language. Precisely when the four main Gospels were written is actually uncertain. What we do know is that they were first published at various stages in the second half of the first century. They are unanimous initially in telling us that Jesus was a Nazarene. This is actually upheld in the Roman annals and the first century chronicles of the Jews and the Bible's Acts of the Apostles confirm that Jesus' brother James and St. Paul were leaders of the sect of the Nazarenes. And this definition of Nazarene is very important to the Grail story because it's become so often misrepresented to suggest that Jesus came from the town of Nazareth. In fact, for the past 400 years, English language Gospels have perpetuated the error by wrongly translating Jesus the Nazarene as Jesus of Nazareth. There was no connection between Nazareth and the Nazarenes. In fact, the settlement at Nazareth was established in the AD 60s, 30 years or so after the crucifixion. Nobody in Jesus' early life came from Nazareth. It was not there. <laughs> The Nazarenes, in fact, were a liberal Jewish sect opposed to the strict Hebrew regime of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Nazarene culture and language were heavily influenced by the philosophers of ancient Greece and their community supported the concept of equal opportunity for men and women. Oh, he must have come from Nazareth. Men and women. This differed from every other document of the time that talked about Nazarene church society. Priestesses existed in equal opportunity with priests. But this was so different from what the male-dominated Hebrew society wanted and what the later male-dominated Roman church required. It's got to be remembered, Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Nazarene a radical, westernized Jew. The Christian movement was founded by others. In the wake of his own mission, the word Christian was first used and first recorded in AD 44 in Antioch in Syria. 
In the Arab world, the word used today as then to describe Jesus and his followers was, still is, Nazareth. This is confirmed in the Muslim Quran. Jesus is Nazareth. His followers are Nazareth. The word means keepers or guardians. The full definition was Nazarene Habrit, keepers of the covenant. In fact, the, the Brit aspect of that is the very root of the country name of Britain. Brit A means covenant land. And in the time of Jesus, the Nazarenes lived in Galilee. And in that place, this mystical place we read about in the Bible, the wilderness. The wilderness was actually a very defined place. It, it, it was essentially the land around the main settlement at Qumran, which spread out to Merd and other places. It was called the wilderness. This is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were produced, discovered not too long ago at Qumran in 1948. Some while after the crucifixion, Peter and his friend Paul went off to Antioch and then they went on to Rome and they began the movement that began Christianity. But as recorded in the other annals, Jesus, his brother James and the majority of other apostles continued the Nazarene movement. They progressed this into Europe. It became the Celtic Church. And the Nazarene movement as a church is documented within the Celtic Church records as being formally implemented as the Church of Jesus in AD 37, four years after the crucifixion. The Roman Church was formed 300 years later, after Paul and Peter's Christians had been persecuted for three centuries. Through many centuries, the Nazarene-based Celtic Church movement was directly opposed, therefore, to the Church of Rome. The difference was a simple one. The Nazarene faith was based on the teachings of Jesus himself. The guts of the religion, the moral codes, the behavioral patterns, the social practices, the, the laws and, and justices related to Old Testament teaching, but with a liberal message of equality in mind. This was the religion of Jesus. Roman Christianity is churchianity, which is not the message of Jesus that's important, this church turned Jesus into the religion. In short, the Nazarene church was the true social church. The Roman church was the church of the emperors and the popes. Was, this was the imperial hybrid movement. Apart from straightforward misunderstandings and misinterpretations and mistranslations, the canonical gospels suffer from numerous purposeful amendments. Some original entries have been changed or deleted. Other entries have been added to suit the church's vested interests. Back in the fourth century, when the texts were translated into Latin from their original Greek and Semitic tongues, the majority of these edits and amendments were made. Even earlier, in about 195 AD, 1,800 years ago, Bishop Clement of Alexandria made the first known amendment from the Gospel text. He deleted a substantial section from the Gospel of Mark written more than a hundred years before that time. And he justified his action in a letter. Even if they should say something true, one who loves the truth should not agree with them. Not all true things are to be said to all men. Interesting. What he meant was that even at that very early stage, there was already a discrepancy between what the gospel writers had written and what the bishops wanted to teach. Today this section, deleted by St. Clement, is still missing from the Gospel of Mark. But when Mark is compared with the gospel that we know today, even without that section, we find that today's gospel is a good deal longer than the original. One of these additional sections comprises the whole of the resurrection sequence. This amounts to 12 full verses at the end of Mark chapter 16. It's now known that everything told about the events after the crucifixion was added by church bishops sometime or their scribes in the late 4th century. This is confirmed in the Vatican archives. It's not a secret. They're there for all to see. 
but they make life so difficult getting to see these things that most people give up and when they get there they don't understand old Greek anyway. But what exactly was in this section of Mark that Clement saw fit to remove? It was actually the section that dealt with the sequence that surrounded the raising of Lazarus. In the context of the original Mark text, however, Lazarus was portrayed in a state of excommunication, spiritual death by decree, not physical death. The account even has Lazarus and Jesus calling to each other before the tomb was opened. This defeated the bishop's desire to portray the raising of Lazarus as a spiritual miracle, not as a simple release from excommunication. More importantly, it set the scene for the story of the crucifixion of Jesus himself, whose own subsequent raising from spiritual death was determined by the same three-day rule that applied to Lazarus. Jesus was raised, that is to say released, resurrected from death by decree on the statutory third day. In the case of Lazarus, however, Jesus had flouted the rules by raising his friend after the three-day period of symbolic sickness. At that point, civil death would have become absolute in the eyes of the, the, the legal elders. Lazarus would have been wrapped in sacking and buried alive. His crime was that he had led a violent people's revolt to safeguard the public water supply which had been diverted through a new Roman aqueduct in Jerusalem. But Jesus performed this release while not, while not holding any priestly entitlement to do so. What happened was that Herod Antipas of Galilee compelled the high priest of Jerusalem to relent in favor of Jesus and boy, this was a miracle. But there was more to the removed section of Mark. Because in telling the story of Lazarus, the Mark account made it perfectly clear that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were actually man and wife. The Lazarus story today in John contains a rather strange sequence that has Martha coming from the Lazarus house to greet Jesus, whereas her sister, Mary Magdalene, remains inside until summoned by Jesus. But in contrast to this, the original Mark account said that Mary Magdalene actually came out of the house with Martha and she was then chastised and told off by the disciples and sent packing back off indoors to await Jesus' instruction. This was a specific procedure of Judaic law at the time whereby a wife was not allowed to emerge from the property, property until instructed by her husband. There's a good deal of information outside the Bible to confirm that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were man and wife. But is there anything relevant in the Gospels today? Anything that the editors missed that tell us the story? Well, there are some specific things and there's some ancillary things. There are seven lists of the women given in the Gospels who permanently seem to follow Jesus around. And these lists include his mother. But in six of these seven lists, the first name, even ahead of his mother, is Mary Magdalene. When one studies other lists of the period, which regard, relate to any form of hierarchical society, the first lady is always the first name. We know the term first lady in America today. The first lady was the most senior. She was always named first and as the messianic queen, she would have been named first as she is. But is the marriage, marriage defined in the Gospels? Well, it is. Many have suggested that the wedding at Cana was perhaps the, the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. No, but it's still in the Bibles. The marriage is the quite separate anointings at Bethany. In Luke, we have a first anointing by Mary of Jesus two and a half years before the second anointing. 
doesn't occur to many people that they're different stories, but they're two and a half years apart. Readers of the first century would have been fully conversant with the two-part ritual of the sacred marriage of a dynastic heir. Jesus, as we know, was a messiah, which means quite simply an anointed one. In fact, all anointed senior priests and Davidic kings were messiahs. Jesus was not unique. Although not an ordained priest, he gained his right to messiah status by way of descent from King David in the kingly line, but he did not achieve that messiah status until he was actually physically anointed by Mary Magdalene in her capacity as a high priestess shortly before the crucifixion. The word Messiah comes from the Hebrew verb to anoint, which in its, itself derives from the Egyptian word Mesa, the holy crocodile. It was with the fat of the Mesa that the Pharaoh's sister brides anointed their husbands on marriage. The Egyptian custom sprang from kingly practice in old Mesopotamia. In the Old Testament Song of Solomon, we hear again of the bridal anointing of the king. It is defined that the oil used in Judah was the fragrant ointment of spikenard, an expensive root oil <coughs> from the Himalayas. And we learn that this anointing ritual was performed always while the husband king sat at the table. In the New Testament, the anointing of Jesus by Mary Magdalene was indeed performed while he sat at the table and with the bridal anointment of spikenard. Afterwards, Mary wiped his feet with her hair and on the first occasion of the two-part marriage, she wept. All of these things, things signify marital anointing of a dynastic heir. Other anointings of messiahs, whether on coronation or admission to the senior priesthood, were always conducted by men, by the high Zadok, the high priest, and the oil used was olive oil. It was mixed with cinnamon and other spices, never ever spikenard. Spikenard was the express prerogative of a messianic bride who had to be a Mary, a sister of a sacred order. Jesus' mother was a Mary, so too would his wife have been a Mary, by title at least, if not by baptismal name. Some conventional orders still maintain the tradition today by adding the title Mary to the baptismal names of their nuns. Sister Mary Teresa, Sister Mary Louise, it's a title. Messianic marriages were always conducted in two stages. The first stage, the anointing in Luke, was the legal commitment to wedlock. The second stage, the anointing in Matthew, Mark and John, was the cementing of the contract. And in Jesus and Mary's case, the second anointing of Bethany was of express significance. And here the Grail story begins, because as explained in books of Jewish law at the time, and by Flavius Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, the second part of this marriage ceremony was never ever conducted until the wife was three months pregnant. Dynastic heirs such as Jesus were expressly required to perpetuate their lines. Marriage was essential, but the law had to protect them against marriage which, which didn't work. Marriage to women who proved barren or, or kept miscarrying. And this protection was provided by the three months pregnancy rule. Miscarriages did not often happen after this term and once they got through that period it was considered safe enough to complete the marriage contract. When anointing her husband at this stage, the Messianic bride in accordance with custom was said to be anointing him for burial. This is confirmed in the Gospels. The bride would from that day carry a vial of, of spikenard around her neck for the rest of her husband's life. She would have used it again on his entombment. It was for this very purpose that Mary Magdalene would have gone to the tomb as she did on the Sabbath after the crucifixion. Subsequent to the Bethany anointing, the gospel relate. Jesus said, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of as a memorial of her. In his famous rendering of the event, the Renaissance artist Fra Angelico actually depicted Jesus placing, placing a crown on the head of Mary Magdalene. But despite the fact that Fra Angelico was a learned 15th century Dominican friar, 
did the Christian church authorities honor Mary Magdalene and speak of this act as a memorial of her? No, they did not. They completely ignored Jesus' own directive and denounced Mary as a whore. For the esoteric church and the Knights Templars, however, Mary Magdalene was always regarded as a saint. She is still revered as such by many today. But the interesting part about this sainthood, when we think about Grail Law, is that Mary is listed as the patron saint of wine growers, the guardian of the vine. The guardian of the Holy Grail, the guardian of the sacred bloodline. There's a lot in the Gospels that we don't presume to be there because we are never encouraged to look beyond the superficial level. We've been aided a lot in this regard in recent years by the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls have opened up a whole new awareness of, of jargon. We have a whole new enlightenment here. They set down the community offices of the Messiah of Israel. They tell us about the council of 12 delegate apostles who were permanently appointed to preside over specific aspects of government and ritual. This leads to a greater awareness of the apostles themselves. We know not, now know not only what their names are, we always knew that, but we can understand who they are, who their families were, what their duties and positions were. We now understand from studying the Gospels that there is an allegory within the Gospels, a use of words that we don't understand today. We now know that baptismal priests were called fishers. We know that those who aided them by hauling the baptismal candidates into the boats in large nets were called fishermen. And we know that the baptismal candidates themselves were called fishes. The apostles James and John were both ordained fishers. The brothers Peter and John were lay fishermen. And Jesus promised Peter and Andrew priesthood within the new ministry, saying, I will make you to become fishers of men. We now know there was a particular jargon of the Gospel era, a jargon that would have been readily understood by anybody reading the Gospels in the first century and beyond. These jargonistic words have been lost to later interpretation. Today, for example, we call our top entertainers stars. But what would a reader, let's presume, in some distant culture at 2,000 years further off in time make of he went to Hollywood to talk to the stars? The Gospels are full of these jargonistic words. The poor, the lepers, the multitude, the blind. None of these was what we presume it to mean today. Definitions such as clouds, sheep, fishes, loaves and a variety of others were all related, just like stars, to people. When the Gospels were written in the first century, they were issued into a Roman controlled environment their content had to be disguised against Roman scrutiny. The information was often political, it was coded, it was veiled, and where important sections appeared, they were often heralded by the words, this is for those with ears to hear, for those who understand the code. It was no different to the coded information passed between members of oppressed groups throughout history. There was a code in documentation found passed between the later Jews in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Jargons, cryptic wording. By use of knowledge of this scribal cryptology, we can now determine dates and locations with very great accuracy. We can uncover many of the hidden meanings in the Gospels down to the extent that the miracles themselves take on a whole new context. In doing this, this does not in any way decry the fact that a man like Jesus, and in fact specifically Jesus, was obviously a very, very special person with enormously special powers. But the Gospels laid down certain stories which have since become described as miracles. These were actually not 
put down because they were really miraculous supernatural events. They were because in the current political arena they were actually quite unprecedented moves that succeeded. We now know other things. We can now tell why the Gospels themselves are in disagreement. That there's really a, a, a passage of the Gospel stories that we can go through with them side by side and see them totally agreeing with each other. Mark says that Jesus was crucified at the third hour. John says Jesus was crucified at the sixth hour. Doesn't seem like much, but actually these three hours of difference are very important. Let's look at the water and wine at Cana. Let's follow the story through what the Bible actually tells us against what we think we know. <coughs> Very straightforward event, dubbed now with supernatural overtones. The Cana wedding out of four Gospels is described only in John. If it was so important to the church as a miracle, where on earth is it in the other three Gospels? It does not say, as is so often said, I've heard it so many times from pulpits, they ran out of wine. Doesn't say that. It says, when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said, they have no wine. The Gospels tell us that the person in charge was the ruler of the feast. This specifically defines it, not as a wedding ceremony as such, but a pre-wedding betrothal feast. The wine taken at betrothal feast was only available to priests and celibate Jews, not to married men, novices, or any others who were regarded as being unsancti unsanctified. They were allowed only water, a purification ritual, as stated in John. When the time came for this ritual, Mary, clearly not happy about the discrimination, directing Jesus' attention to the unsanctified guest, says, they have no wine. Having not been anointed yet to Messiah status, Jesus responded and said, my hour hath not yet come. At which Mary forced the issue, Jesus flouted convention, abandoning water altogether, wine for everyone. The ruler of the feast makes no comment whatsoever about any miracle. He simply expresses amazement that the wine has turned up at that stage of the proceedings. It's been suggested often that the wedding at Cana was Jesus' own wedding ceremony because he and his mother displayed a rite of command that would not be associated with ordinary guests. However, this feast we can determine precisely, was held in June AD 30. First weddings were always held in the atonement month of September. Betrothal feasts were held three months before that. They do actually coincide because in the year of AD 30, the year of the June betrothal feast at Cana, we find that in September of that very year, three months afterwards, comes the first anointing of Jesus by Mary Magdalene. So, although it wasn't actually their wedding, it does look pretty certain that its importance was the fact that it was their own betrothal feast. The Gospels tell a story that although not always in agreement with the counterparts in other Gospels, is actually followable outside of the Bible. The accounts of Jesus' activities right up to the time of the crucifixion can be found in various records of Imperial Rome and in the official annals of Imperial Rome, the trial by Pilate and the crucifixion is mentioned. We can determine precisely from this chronological diary of the Roman government that the crucifixion took place at the March Passover of AD 33. The Bethany second marriage anointing was in the week prior to that. At that stage we know that Mary Magdalene had to have been by law three months pregnant which means she should have given birth in the September of AD 33. That we'll come back to. If the Gospels 
read as they are written, Jesus appears as a liberating dinner, endeavouring to unite the people of the area against the oppression of the Roman Empire. Judea at the time was just like France under German occupation in World War II. The authorities were controlled by the military occupational force. Resistance movements were common. Jesus was awaited for, expected, anticipated, and at the end of the story, even anointed Messiah. In the first century antiquities of the Jews, Jesus is called a wise man, a teacher, and the king. Nothing about divinity. Teacher, a wise man, the king. While the Dead Sea Scrolls identify the Messiah of Israel as the supreme military commander of Israel. It's no secret the apostles were armed. From the time of recruitment, Jesus checked that they all had swords. At the very end of the story, Peter draws his sword against Malchus. Jesus says, I come not to send peace but a sword. Many of the high-ranking Jews in Jerusalem were quite content to hold positions of power backed by a foreign military regime. And apart from that, the Hebrew groups themselves were sectarian. They did not want to share their God, Jehovah, with anybody else, specifically unclean Gentiles. So the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Jews were God's chosen people. He belonged to them. They belonged to him. But there were other Jews. There were the Nazarenes. There were the Essenes who were influenced by a more liberal Western doctrine. In the event Jesus' mission failed, the rift was insurmountable. Gentle Gentiles in modern day language are simply Arab races, non-Jews, Arabs, and the rift is still there today. The sentencing of Jesus was by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, but he was actually condemned and excommunicated prior to that by the Sanhedrin Council. It was decided to contrive a punishment sentence by the Roman governor who was already trying other prisoners for leading insurrections against himself. Pilate had been the object of an insurrection. As confirmed by the Supreme Judge and Attorney General of Israel even today, it was quite illegal for the Sanhedrin Council to sit at night or to sit and operate during the Passover, so the timing was perfect. They had a perfect opportunity and a reason to say, sorry, we cannot do this ourselves. You, the Roman governor, have to do this. As for Jesus' death on the cross, it's perfectly plain this was spiritual death, not physical death as determined by the three-day rule that everybody in the first century reading this would have understood. In civil and legal terms, Jesus was already dead when he was placed on the cross. He was denounced, scourged, prepared for death by decree. We would call this today excommunication. But for three days, he is still nominally, nominally sick. Absolute death comes on the fourth day and on that day, he would be entombed, buried alive. But during the first days, three days, he could be raised or resurrected. In fact, he predicted that he would. Raisings and resurrections, apart from the fact that Jesus once flouted the rule and that was a miracle, could only be performed by the high priest or by the father of the community. The high priest at that time was Joseph Caiaphas, the very man who condemned Jesus, Therefore, the raising had to be performed by the patriarchal father. And there are gospel accounts of Jesus talking to the father from the cross, culminating in, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And at that time, we know from the listings that the appointed father was the Magian apostle Simon Zelotes. We've been taught that Jesus' physical death was proved by the blood and water that flowed when he was pierced by the spear. But this has been very badly translated. The original word does not translate to pierced, it translates to pricked or to scratched. This in turn was mistranslated into the Latin verb to open and into the English word pierced. They were not primitive times. They were times when actually there were doctors, medical men, there were even forms of hospital. And we can look these up. 
we can actually see that just like today, the test for reflex action was scratching, prodding or pricking the skin with a sharp instrument. I've got a letter in my possession from surgeon of the British Medical Council. It says, medically the outflow of water is impossible to explain. Blood flowing from a stab wound is evidence of life, not death. It would take a large gaping laceration for any drop of blood to flow from a dead body because there is no vascular action. So let's look further. Let's look at what the Gospels actually said. Joseph of Arimathea took down Jesus' body from the cross. Our body must be dead. In fact, the word translated to body was the Greek word soma, meaning live body. The alternative word denoting dead body would have been toma. Soma, live body, was translated into the English word body. Toma would have been translated to corpse. Jesus very apparently survived. This is explicitly maintained in other books. Even the Quran says that Jesus survived the crucifixion. But during that Friday afternoon, when he was on the cross, we can actually find a three-hour forward time change of the clocks on that day, or the equivalent of clocks on that day. The clocks in that time of day were sundials and priests who marched around squares on the floor to denote the hours. In essence, there were daytime hours and there were nighttime hours. Today we have a 24-hour day. In John, Jesus says, are there not 12 hours in a day? Yes, there were 12 hours in a day and there were 12 hours in the night. And daytime started at sunup. So, from time to time, the beginning of daytime changed. Thus, the beginning of nighttime changed. In March, the beginning of daytime would have been somewhere around about six o'clock in the morning as, as we know it. We know that Joseph conspired with Pontius Pilate to have Jesus removed the from the cross after a few hours of hanging. The Gospels don't actually agree on the sequence of events here. Because some use the time before the time change, some use the time after the time change, but three hours disappeared from the day to be replaced by three night time hours, daylight hours were substituted by hours of darkness. The land fell into darkness for three hours, we are told in the Gospels, yes. Today we would simply, in a split second, add three night time hours to the day. But these three hours that were the crux of every single event that followed because the Hebrew lunarists made their change during the daytime. The solarists, of which the Essenes were a faction, did not make their change until midnight. Which actually meant that yes, when reading the gospel that talks about Hebrew time, Jesus was crucified at the third hour. The other solar time, he was crucified at the sixth hour. On that evening, the Jews began their Sabbath at nine o'clock. But to the Essenes, they still had three hours to go before the Sabbath. It was those three hours that actually enabled them to work with Jesus, on Jesus, and for Jesus during a period of time in which nobody else was allowed to undertake any physical work whatsoever. And so we come to the, probably one of the most misunderstood events of the Bible, and from that moment we'll move on to the second half, moving beyond the Bible period through history to tell you what happened to the family and what happened to this child born in September AD 33. The most misunderstood event in the Bible is the Ascension. And in discussing the Ascension, we'll discuss the births of his three children and their descendants. But before that, I think probably a good time to have a few questions and then we'll have a break. Hi. Hello there. Are you aware of the book uh, writ written by a Frenchman living in Australia, Abduction to the Ninth Planet? 
abduction to the ninth no, the, planet. No, I, I don't recognise the title at all. In that, it's, it's suggested that the uh, entity that was crucified wasn't Jesus who b bore the children, that it was uh, an adult body that was created uh, by the people from the ninth planet to go through the exercise of the crucifixion to prove a point. This is actually, uh, um, I mean, I don't know the, the root of that particular book, but this is actually quite a Muslim concept. Um, I mean, th there are two main stories that surround the crucifixion event, apart from the way that, that, that I say the Gospels describe it. But the two main stories are, one, as you say, that, that Jesus was supplanted, substituted by another physical entity that was crucified in his stead. And the other story is that there was a personal substitute, another man who was put on the cross in place of him. Yes, I mean, I'm aware of both of those stories, but the fact remains that by the time that Jesus had been anointed a Messiah, he was actually only a week away from the deadline date of the vernal equinox of that year, which was John the Baptist's last date of prophecy for the Messiah to emerge. Now time was running very, very short then and Jesus and his disciples must have been panicking a little bit because just about everything else that they tried was not working. Some of the Jews were accepting Jesus as the, the ultimate saviour they were expecting and others weren't. But, as explained in John, these things were done to fulfill the prophecy and the prophe prophecy that was fulfilled is a prophecy from the Old Testament which says you will ultimately recognize the Messiah because he shall be wounded what, by his friends and shall emerge with holes in his hands. That comes straight from the Old Testament. This was the prophecy, probably the last stance, the last ditch stand that Jesus could have actually done to prove that he was the Messiah by way of fulfilling a prophecy. So what I perceive is that yes, I understand there are these other stories and, and that they have been written down in time, but thinking back to the way things were, it rather seems that Jesus would physically have had to have gone through that procedure personally to approve the point. Otherwise, he, he would have been thoroughly denounced at that time. Okay. Right, thank you. Yes, thank I think you. you'd find that book worth reading. Yes, thank you very much for that. Thank you for being here and being so articulate with us. Thank you. Um, in the reading of the book up to page 162, and you may have presented uh, additional information later on, my request is, uh, after the break, would you expand on the latter days of Jesus? Um, it seemed to be very thin, and a lot of in information, wonderful information, was expanded on lots of other folks, but yeah. I'm not quite sure uh, what his last years looked like and, and how he finally you know, went into the ethers, etc. Yes, I, 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 I will, in fact, I will be doing that for a very good reason in a subsequent book. The Bloodline of the Holy Grail, as it emerged, still a very large book of 500 odd pages, was edited back from something about four times its size. Um, it had to be, otherwise it would have been a series of volumes and nobody would have been able to afford to buy it. Now, what happened was that it was published by Element Books. Now, somebody else said to me only yesterday, how is it that you don't expand a lot more on the fact that, that Jesus' upbringing was very largely Buddhist influenced, that the Essenes were very Buddhist influenced? And the answer to that question is identical to the answer to your question. At the moment in time that Bloodline was being released, it was hot on the heels of other element books that were about those specific subjects and those subjects alone. And so it was determined that rather than duplicate information or cause contrary information to arrive in the marketplace at the same time, it would be better to leave certain aspects of the story out of Bloodline. The importance of Bloodline was not, when we considered it, Jesus' latter life or his place or final date of death but the fact of the date of his marriage 
on the dates of the birth of the children. And that's the route that I took in Bloodline. But yes, so many people have said to me what you said. I have to do it in the next book. I mean, I really do have to cover that groundwork. Jesus actually died in AD 73. So I appreciate that context. Will you give us a sneak preview of some of that information? Well, to start with, Jesus' in life... Yeah, I mean, just very quickly now, we can follow Jesus' life for a number of years through the Acts of the Apostles. In chronological sequence, they continue the Gospel story. Um, because of the resurrection, there is a word that has been introduced into the Acts of the Apostles so many times it is unbelievable when you look at original documents. And that word is vision. This word just did not appear in the original text. He saw Jesus, he met Jesus, he did this with Jesus, and what does it keep saying to us? He saw a vision of Jesus, he saw an image of Jesus, they walked with a vision of Jesus, they were with Jesus. I mean, it follows his story. We can follow Jesus to Malta, we can follow him to Antioch, we can follow him to Greece, we can follow him to Rome, and the most beautiful part about the New Testament, and I will cover this later on, is that we can follow him actually to his final day in the New Testament. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, I want to acknowledge you for actually being a living example of the Holy Grail, what you, tra what you teach and what you speak by yeah. sharing and serving humanity with your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, the, uh, the Essenes and that Judaic uh, lineage that Jay-Z touched upon a little bit. Um, you mentioned that the Essenes were a more liberal group of the Judaic lineage, but you also mentioned that um, when Mary Magdalene was at the house of Lazarus, that she was actually in the presence of some of Jesus' people chastised yep. for, right. for acting perhaps a little more liberal. So um, there, there, I just wanted to um, state again that there was still huge amounts of restrictions put on women, even though it was a more um, liberal line of the Judaic heritage. Mm. Yes, I mean, there, there is a seeming anomaly there. But isn't there in all of our lives? Don't we all follow specific aspects of specific things that we do, but in daily life we are still confronted and have to obey laws of the land or laws of local community society that maybe we think are rather stupid and we'd rather not, but until somebody comes along and changes them, there they are. I, I this is open domain stuff. So yes, although it, it, in the general structure of the Essene environment, um, they would have constructed their lifestyles according to a certain pattern. When in the open domain, yes, of course, Judaic law as a whole would have prevailed. And in fact, over and above that, Roman law would have prevailed. Right. Now, did they uh, actually, um, did they have to perhaps hide their, um, their interactions or their, their relationships with women in a greater, more external sense? No. Um, I mean, the, the Essenes, they're, they're written about in so many books and it mystifies me why, as if there's some mysterious sect to understand. When in actual fact, I mean, one only has to look through the antiquities of the Jews and the wars of the Jews. I mean, a book that's in every major bookstore here, or, or in any European country for that matter, to find that the Essenes are studied in great depth and great detail by Josephus. Their, their beliefs, their methods, their ways, their laws, their thought patterns, their differences are, are, are set down. There is nothing mysterious about them, but what we do know from it is that there were two distinct groups within the Essene community. Okay. Essentially, they were monastic. They exemplified the celibate tradition. And so the Essenes have a reputation of being a whole lot of hermit monks somewhere out there in the desert. But the Essenes also included the Nazarene movement, which was actually bound by slightly different regulations. But it also housed the dynastic succession of 
the angelic priests, the Zadokite priests, the kingly line of David, numerous hereditary dynastic progressions that had to be, even under their law, perpetuated. So certain people were not only allowed to marry, but were expressly required to marry. The rules governing dynastic heirs such as Jesus in the royal line not only had to be married, but had to produce at least two sons. And there are rules which we'll get on to as I talk in the second half. So, yeah, nothing mystical about the Essenes, a monastic movement, but just like the early uh, Celtic monastic movements within those structures were hereditary orders and they had to marry and perpetuate their lines. So, in that respect, they run like the Jewish family norm, which was a very family-oriented thing. You know, wives, mothers, let's get married and let's have lots of children. That's always been the way. And in fact, in, in, in Jewish society as a whole generally, it's sort of regarded that you're not a Jew unless your mother was a Jew. Um, I'm not quite sure how that works, because it determines that your father could be anything. But, but, but theoretically, the mother the mother governs it. You are a Jew if your mother was a Jew. And that comes from those very ancient times um, of, of, of Judaic law, um, when, when in fact dynastic heirs were forced to marry Jewesses. They had to marry Jewesses. They could not marry outside the bloodline or outside the family. Um, but anybody can read this. I mean, it's not secret information. It's, it's out there in all the bookshops. I understand. Um, just a little bit of a continuation on that. So any woman alive could actually say that, that I am the product of a successful chain of, un, of an unbroken chain of successful births since the beginning of time. And that line is very clear. And that, that actually any male that comes in and, and, and adds to that line is something that's woven in as opposed to a very clean line that would make a, a bloodline actually more um, maternal than paternal. You got it. The Jewish lines were still at that time very paternally oriented, is that correct? It came from Egypt and it came from ancient Sumer before that, and we'll be talking about it later on. The true bloodline was matriarchal. Thank you. It is why the pharaohs had to marry sisters. Hi. Um, it's obvious that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. So what was his birthday? Oh, well... Oh, second half of the question... Yeah, I will, I will tell you that because he actually had three birthdays. Just... <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we'll come on to that one. So what is your understanding of the Christmas celebration, the tradition of Christmas? I'll cover that as well. The Christmas that we know today was not known by anybody until the 4th century. But I shall cover that in okay. detail. Thank you.